أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم السلام على خير خلقه أجمعين نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وهل أتاك حديث موسى إذ رأى نارا فقال لأهلهم كثوا إني آنست نارا لعلي آتيكم منها بقبس أو أجد على النار هدى فلما أتاها نودي يا موسى إنني أنا الله لا إله وإني أنا ربك فاخلعن عليك إنك بالوادي المقدس طوى وأنا اخترتك فاستمع لما يوس لما يوحى أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم please recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad one of the beautiful aspects of the holy Quran is the emphasis upon the respect and the love and the following and the reverence for all the prophets of God. In other words, what we often emphasize upon is when it comes to interfaith dialogue, when it comes to discussions regarding the various denominations and religions, the religion of Islam emphasizes the need to recognize all the prophets sent by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala as ambassadors, as his chosen servants for the salvation of mankind. And that's why you find that their stories are mentioned often more than the reference to the holy beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In essence, that we find that uh, one of the common misconceptions that is presented against the religion and specifically against the Holy Quran is that it's the words of the Holy Prophet. People say that the Prophet himself wrote the Quran. One answer that we present in addition to the fact that it's a miracle from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and that it has remained unchallenged and undefeated for 1400 years is the fact that if it was from the Holy Prophet, you will find more reference or more mentioning of him than others. In other words, if somebody is to write a book about themselves or wanting others to follow him, surely that individual would not mention others many, many more times more than himself. At least Musa alayhi salam, more than 130 times he's mentioned, yes? Whereas the Holy Prophet is mentioned by name four times. And that's a clear indication about the fact that the Qur'an is indeed the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the author is not the Holy Prophet. Yet at the same time also what do we find is that the stories that are presented there are a source of tranquility. And if you um, investigate the cause of revelation for certain chapters of the Qur'an, you'll find that they were revealed at times which were relevant during the time of the Holy Prophet, during the seerah. So we find, for instance, in Surah Hud, verse number 120, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says, وَكُلَّا نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فؤادك. That we reveal to you the stories of the messengers so that your heart seeks or attains tranquility, some form of acceptance, some fo form of peace, so that the Prophet of Islam is aware that the Prophets that came before him indeed went through so much and um, endured suffering and torment by their communities, yet Allah wa Taala still granted them victory ultimately and a remembrance by the people and their legacies continue. Musa alayhi salam therefore is mentioned in many places in the Holy Quran and one of those in, is in chapter 20 Surah Taha as we began the uh, examination of his uh, um, story as mentioned in this particular chapter last week. 
The Quran in Surah Taha begins with the reference to Musa and his journey towards Egypt after he had left from Egypt 10 years earlier, went to Madian and uh, met Prophet Shu'aib, married one of his daughters. Now he's on his way back and <clears throat> he is in a bit of a difficult situation, as we mentioned, that it was a um, desert, it was dark, uh, it was cold, and his wife was about to give birth, she was pregnant. It's likely that there was someone else with them, a child or someone else traveling with them at least. And uh, Mu Musa alayhi salam found it increasingly difficult to deal with the situation. And at that moment, Allah ta'ala tells us that Musa saw what he thought was fire. إِذْ رَأَى نَارًا فَقَالَ لِأَهْلِهِمْ كُثُوا Musa alayhi salam recognizes that there may be something that he can benefit from. Why? Because he was unaware of the way to take towards Egypt as he had taken an unconventional route. But one thing that stands out here at the outset is Musa, peace be upon him, was an individual whom the Qur'an portrays as a person always thinking about others. It's interesting because here he uh, says to his wife, فَقَالَ لِأَهْلِهِمْ كُثُوا He communicates with his wife and he said, wait. And imkath here comes from the idea of, uh, for a short period of time, settle whilst I go and investigate what this fire is all about. But it's interesting that he's thinking about his wife and whoever's with them and their interests. Likewise, when you read the story of Musa with Khidr, Prophet Khidr alayhi salam, you'll find that when Khidr made this particular um, small hole in the ship, Musa, the way he spoke to Khidr was that, are you going to cause the people to drown? So he didn't say, how are we going to survive? What are you going to do to save us? He was thinking about the inhabitants and the people of the ship. لِتُغْرِقَ أَهْلَهَا All of us together. So he's thinking collectively, not individually. That's what's um, interesting about Musa at the outset. What we find, of course, is he says, إِنِّي أَنَسْتُ Anas here means finding something which is desirable. Yeah, so finding something that one is looking for. He was, of course, looking for something like a fire or some direction. And he says, لَعَلِّي آتِيكُمْ مِنْهَا بِقَبَسِ Qabas is often, you know, back in the time, not so much now, maybe now when people go on camping and whatever, when you take a piece of wood and you find a, uh, a fire or you light up a fire and then you use the wood to what? To somehow transfer the fire somewhere else so the tip of the wood is starts to burn or you're carrying the fire with you yes that's qabas in arabic so musa says to his wife and whoever's with, with was with them wait here i see fire i want to get you some of it or oh or maybe there will be people who will guide me or show me the path why because fire is an indication that there are people around it. It won't start by itself normally. And back in the time, what they used to have is that they used to light up on top of the hills, small areas, in order to indicate that there are a group of people who have gathered, certainly at night, and they have sat down and, you know, they will continue on their journey, but at least they'll be there at night time. Now, <clears throat> One thing that, of course, uh, the, the individual who reflects on these beautiful verses will be able to extrapolate many issues here. I did not find uh, any of the Mufassirin touch on this, but of course this is open for all of us to look at these ayat and think, okay, what does it actually mean? And for me personally, when I looked at that verse, it highlighted the importance of communication between the husband and wife. Because Musa, when he saw his wife is in distress and he saw something that may be of help, he did not say, you know, wait, wait here, I'll be back. He actually explained to his wife 
what he is about to do and what was his purpose for leaving his wife for a few moments. He could have said, إِذْ رَأَى نَارًا فَقَالَ لِأَهْلِهِمْ كُثُوا That's it. Wait here. But there is a description, and this highlights the significance of communication. Today, between married couples, today we have um, statistics and those who work in marital therapy and counseling, and they say the majority of marital breakdowns is as a result of what? As a result of a lack of communication, lack of understanding yeah, between both the husband and the wife. So it seems to be a key element for a successful marital relationship. And Musa alayhi salam here demonstrates it. He informs his wife the exact purpose why he is about to leave her in order to help her and to solve this difficult situation. The other point that we look at this ayah number 10 in chapter 20 is the Quran here seemingly has used the word ahl to refer to the wife, isn't it? Because here we're talking about the wife of Musa and Musa says li ahlihi, the Quran says li ahlihi, yes? And some people have used this verse to say the wives of the Holy Prophet are included in Ahlul Bayt. Yes? Because we have, of course, part of Ayah 33. Yes? And this particular reference to the progeny or the family of the Holy Prophet is one that has been disputed and is a matter of discussion amongst theologians and the commentators of the Quran and Muslim sects. However, what has been interesting is the uh, development of the ideas surrounding the word Ahl in the Holy Quran. So some people have said, okay, here the word Ahl is used and Allah means his wife. Therefore, whatever, if you want to include Amir al-Mu'mineen, Fatima al-Zahra, Hassan al-Hussein, in the definition of Ahl al-Bayt, include them, no problem. But at least you must also include who? The wives. Because here it says li ahlihi. Yeah? Now, how do we answer this particular misconception? Number one, if you go to the uh, books of Arab, Arabic uh, lexography or the lexographists themselves, like for instance Ibn Mandur or Al-Raghib by Al-Isfahani, these texts, which are classical, they define Arabic words. What do they actually mean? Yeah. Now they say ahl generally means any form of a relationship. And it does not denote a wife whatsoever. Yes. And they give examples to illustrate this. They say it's a ma'nan am. It's a general understanding of uh, the term without any particular reference to a person. So they say, evidences, we have Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book. We have Ahlul Dunya, the people of this world. In fact, you can put Ahlul anything. Yes? The people of. Because that establishes a relationship between two entities, two groups of people. Yes? Here, the argument is, is a simple relationship between a husband and a wife and that's why he's used the word ahl as a general usage as a general usage of, an, of a relationship people will say okay how about the term ahlul bayt could that also mean a wife as a relationship we say the term ahlul bayt is specific the term ahl is general Ahlul Bayt is specific in the Holy Quran. And how do we know whom the Ahlul Bayt are? Definitely we have to refer back to the narrations. The narrations quite specifically tell us about the identity of whom the Ahlul Bayt are. Such as the famous, of course, narrations that point to the Holy Five being mentioned and specifically referred to as the household of the Holy Prophet when this particular ayah was revealed, as uh, commonly narrated by Sunni and Shia narrators of hadith. In addition, of course, to the discussions that take place between theologians that the word Ahlul Bayt cannot include the wives of the Holy Prophet 
because the Quran has said the Ahl al-Bayt have been purified and thoroughly, thoroughly cleansed, yes, and protected from any sins or wrongdoings or errors or misgivings or any negativity, so to speak. Whereas the Quran also in chapter 66 speaks about two wives of the Prophet and rebukes two wives of the Prophet and says, both of you have committed a sin, you must seek tawbah. And you must return back to Allah and ask for forgiveness. Why? Because they both conspired against the Holy Prophet according to Imam al-Bukhari Sahih. So it's not a Shia conspiracy against the wives of the Prophet. It is a Quranic fact. And simply the notion that the wives are included in Ahl al-Bayt cannot be accepted because Ahl al-Bayt are purified and they are sinless, error-free, whereas the Quran quite categorically establishes the fact that the wives erred at least or they sinned. And of course, the wife of the Holy Prophet Aisha who stood against the Khalifa of her time and caused so many people to be killed is another testimony of this particular uh, uh, realization. فَلَمَّا أَتَاهَا نُودِيَ يَا مُوسَى إِنِّي أَنَا رَبُّكَ He approached the tree. Now Musa has left his wife, his child, and now he is going towards this particular tree. He gets close to this tree. The Quran tells us, interestingly, in chapter 28, verse number 30, that this was a very specific tree which has a blessed element to it. Nudiya min shati'il wadi al-aymani fil buq'ati al-mubarakati min ash-shajara. This is in chapter 20, 28, verse number 30. That he was called from the bank of the right side of the valley where there was a tree in the valley of Tua. Yes, he heard this particular voice or this sound. As he got closer, he realized, Musa السلام, realized it was not fire, it was immense light that was coming out from this particular tree. Yeah? And he began to understand that this is a great occurrence, it's a great event. It's not a normal incident that the fire, so to speak, was not burning the tree. And therefore, he realized it was light. Yeah? Narrations say that Musa shahad al-nur as-sati' wa sami'a tasbih al-mala'ika. Musa saw this overwhelming, powerful light radiating from the tree. And at the same time, he heard the glorification of Allah by the angels. He was called. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him and that's why he's known as Kalimullah. First thing to say here is, of course, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he um, here refers, Nudiya ya Musa, inni ana rabbuk. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, of course, does not have a, a voice box or a vocal cord or this notion of a noise or a sound coming out from him. Hasha lillah. Definitely he created some kind of a sound. Yes, something that Musa السلام, was able to hear. And incidentally, Allama Tabatabai says, the Quran says, naran. Only Musa saw this fire. His wife and whoever was with them did not. Because otherwise, the Quran would have said they all saw the fire. Which made it more important for Musa to communicate with his wife and say, you know what, I could see some fire, wait, let me get you part of it. Or seek guidance about the way to take from that particular area. This inni ana rabbuk. Twice Allah wa ta'ala emphasizes it is him that is speaking to Musa alayhi salam. Inni is I am, Ana is once again I. So in two emphatic ways, Allah wa ta'ala is saying to Musa, look, it's me who is speaking to you, your Lord. Why has Allah not used the word Allah, for instance here, or could have said, Inni Anallahu Rabbul Alameen? 
it is suggested that Rabbuk denotes compassion, denotes lordship, denotes some kind of uh, ease in order to calm Musa السلام, down. It was more of an intimate way to introduce this particular event or what is about to happen. Inni ana rabbuk. To make Musa comfortable and to make him go through a very simple uh, transition into this very significant incident. Because of course Musa is receiving his first revelation. Musa is receiving the wahi. Now people ask the question, how did Musa know this was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How does he know it's the wahi? How does he know it's from God? And in order to answer this, we have to, of course, refer to the Holy Quran in Surah Shura, verse number 51. The Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us about the way in which he communicates with his prophets. And the way the wahi is established, revelation. How does revelation happen? Yes. وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَنْ يُكَلِّمَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا وَحْيًا أَوْ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ أَوْ يُرْسِلَ رَسُولًا فَيُوحِي بِإِذْنِهِ مَا يَشَاءُ Allah says there are three ways that He establishes a communication with human beings, essentially the prophets. Yeah. The first is through wahi, and this wahi is understood to be intuition. The presence of knowledge in the heart. Yeah? Knowledge by presence, as it's referred to. This is also understood to be al ilm al ladunni, yeah? that is placed in the heart of God's chosen servants. Now, one thing to appreciate here a slightly different and of course, less significant intuition happens for all human beings. And it's possible. In fact, not only human beings. That the honeybee is communicated to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mother of Musa alayhi salam was communicated to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? Now this is intuition through the heart. It was praised by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala in their heart. Yet in this particular instance, it is specific to the prophets. Here, this wahi is in reference to the prophets. And we'll come back to how they know it's from God. So they, they are given this information, this knowledge in their hearts. How do they know it's from Him, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala? We'll come back to that in just a moment. The Quran then says the other way that Allah communicates with His uh, prophets is through hijab, through a veil. What is this veil? An example is this. So the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala creates something and through that creation there is a communication. Here it's that tree. And the noise or the sound can come, comes from that particular creation. And in this example it's a tree. Oh, يُرْسِلَ رَسُولًا فَيُوحِي بِإِذْنِهِ مَا يَشَاءُ Or he sends a messenger. And in this uh, instance or in this ayah, the messenger is in reference to an angel. So for instance, our holy beloved Prophet, Rasul Al-Azam Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He received revelation using all these ways. Yeah. Most likely, most of them through the intuition of the heart, some through seeing Jibra'il alayhi salam, and that was the most difficult. He used to sweat a lot, you know, and uh, these methods are somehow universal across the prophets in, a different, in, in many ways. But there is a huge problem in Islamic history and when I mention these, I mention them for knowledge purposes, for academic discussions, and in no shape or form attacks on any individuals or schools of thought, but rather to have an understanding of where we stand in this difficult uh, depiction of the Holy Prophet, certainly when it comes to revelation. Why I mention this? Because if you look at the world of Hadith and uh, investigate 
the first revelation. In other words, when the Holy Beloved Prophet received the first revelation, you find a, a very interesting number of narrations which points to us an idea that the Prophet was unsure when he first got the revelation. He was hesitant. He was unaware where was this from. So, for instance, you find in uh, Sahih Muslim, volume 1, page 97, volume 9 of Bukhari, page 38, um, you find, for instance, in Al Bidaya wa Nihaya for Ibn Kathir, Sirat Ibn Hisham, Al Tabari, Al Sir Al Halabiyya, they all mention this story about the Prophet. What is the story? That the Prophet of Islam was in Ghar Hara and the angel came for the first time, Archangel Jibrail alayhi salam, to communicate and to reveal the first message. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. So the angel said to the Prophet, Iqra. And the Prophet said, Ma ana biqari, according to these particular references, I do not read. Then the Prophet himself says, and by the way, this, these narrations are narrated by uh, either well, Prophet's wife Aisha or Urwa ibn Zuh uh, Zubair or a man by the name of Zuhari or Zuhari. These three are the people who narrate the hadith about how the Prophet first received the revelation. So they say the Prophet said, what did he say? He said, the archangel came, said to me, read. I said, I don't read. Then, فأخذني. Then he took me. And he squeezed me in a very intense squeezing three times. Yeah? Intensely. Very difficult, you know? He grabbed me in such a way whilst inside the cave of Hira. And the narration then says, فَخَرَجَ nabi The Prophet left. He was shaking. Yes? And he said to his wife, زَمِّلُونِي 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 means cover me, cover me. Yeah. Now, his wife covers him, Khadija sallallahu alayhi according to these narrations, covers him, and then says to him, what's wrong? What's happened? So he says, the Prophet says, I don't know what's happened, something strange. I feel that there may be an influence from the jinn. It may be some supernatural powers have got the better of me. Khadija reassures him. And says to him, فَقَالَتْ خَدِيجَ كَلَّا وَاللَّهِ مَا يُخْزِيكَ اللَّهُ أَبَدًا Allah will never disgrace you in such a way. But let's do this. Let's go to my cousin, Waraq ibn Nawfal, who's a Christian monk, and check with him. So they both go, they sit with Waraq ibn Nawfal, who was uh, an established scholar at that time. And uh, he had become an blind at his uh, uh, old age. And the Prophet told him what has happened. And so Waraka seemingly accepts and says, I think these are signs of prophethood. And I wish that I was with you when your community drives you out. The Prophet said, would they drive me out, my own community? And Waraka said, yes, indeed. People before you, the Prophets that came before you were also attacked and mistreated by their own communities. The Prophet now leaves from Waraqa. He goes back, but then for a while, he does not hear anything. There's no revelation. So now further doubt creeps into his mind. I have to mention, this is not in our books, in case these clips are taken, put on YouTube and say, this is what the Shia believe, yes? Mm -hmm. This is not in our books, yes? Th this idea of doubt, we reject them completely. The key thing here though is that Unfortunately, as you investigate further in uh, books of uh, uh, Bukhari, the Prophet of Islam, what did he do? He went up at the mountain of Hira. He was doubtful about the message and he decided to end his life because he was so uncertain. What are, you know, those noises that I heard, that voice that I got, it must have been a jinn because I did not receive anything. Yeah? And as soon as he wanted to throw himself from the top of the cliff, Jibra'il comes to him and says, Ya Muhammad, inna kala Rasulullah. No, 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 don't do this. You are a messenger of God. So the Prophet of Islam does is he retracts back, then he goes back again because he's still uncertain and decides to do this three times and Jibra'il for three times comes back and says to him, don't do it. But unfortunately, 
what is disappointing is that, you know, when these individuals, when they fabricate, they, they start to get excited. So they keep fabricating. And the story doesn't end there. I mean, by itself, till now, it is shocking and unacceptable, but it continues. And why I've mentioned it? Because it's relevant. It's very relevant to what we're going through now. The Prophet, apparently, according to these narrations which we reject, has, has uh, then comes down and sees Khadija and complains to Khadija that, look, I'm still uncertain that, there, that I'm being uh, chosen as a prophet or there's a communication, as your cousin said. So Khadija said, we do a litmus test. She didn't say litmus test, but she said, let's do something, you know, which proves that you're a prophet or not. So what should we do? He, she says to him, I want you, and she's wearing a hijab, she says to him, I want you to sit on my right lap. Do you see this kind of angel? So the prophet sits and says, yes, I can see. She says, okay, sit on my left lap. Can you see this angel? The Prophet says, I can see. Then she says, I will take my hijab off. So she takes her hijab off. Then she says to the Prophet, can you see? And he says, no, I can't see. She says, it's definitely an angel. And similar uh, stories and um, uh, narrations exist. Of course, without going into the details of it, and if you look at the Sanad, the chain of narrations is weak, is unacceptable for these narrations at le uh, to start off with, but also it clearly demonstrates um, uh, weakness in, on, on uh, God forbid, on the position of the Holy Prophet that he, at the beginning of the prophethood, was uncertain, yes, and he had to seek some kind of uh, um, justification or agreement or some kind of authentication from a Christian monk. But what is, of course, unacceptable is that we consider people who want to kill themselves as some people who need help psychologically, mentally, that they need to be supported and so on. And we will not accept this about anyone. How can we ever suggest that the Prophet of Islam, who is the greatest human being created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would ever go to that particular extent? Yeah. Especially as, of course, the verses of the Qur'an quite clearly demonstrate the fact that he had certainty. Like for instance, you find in Surah Al-An'am, verse number 57, min rabbi. I have a clear vision from my Lord. I understand what is happening. And in Surah Yusuf, verse 108, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي I have basira, I have understanding of what's going on. آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ The Prophet is aware and is believing in what the, the, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to him. Yeah. So, in essence, uh, the the story is rejected, but unfortunately it was used for this 14-minute clip, The Innocence of Muslims, that caused so much outrage in the Muslim world, you know? This clip that was released last year, or maybe the year before actually, which, you know, uh, was ba blasphemous against the Prophet, and uh, it was um, unacceptable, yes? Under any circumstances, we not accepted. Yet sadly, the narrations or the, 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 the storyline is taken from these narrations. Yeah? And the Muslim world is so angry and comes out and threatens and burns effigies. Yet they don't realize in their own libraries, maybe in their own bookshelves, these are the stories that are mentioned about the Holy Prophet. Yeah? And that's why we always mention that we have no doubt and we say it with confidence and with yaqeen. There is no school of thought or denomination or Muslim group that respects and honors and exonerates the Prophet like the school of Ahl al-Bayt. That the school of Ahl al-Bayt purifies the Prophet from any wrongdoings or any mishaps or any sins or errors or mistakes or anything in that regard is completely rejected in the school of Ahl al-Bayt. Therefore, the question here that is posed, how does a prophet know, such as our holy beloved prophet, O Musa alayhi salam here, when he hears this particular sound coming from the tree, how does he know? It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was, of course, asked to 
our Imams. Uh, we have a narration from Zurara, the companion of Imam Sadiq from Abu Abdullah Sadiq and he was asked, how do we know if a prophet, had, how can we be sure that the prophet knew this is from God and not shaitan? Because of course we have the story of satanic verses, yes, where Alhamdulillah, majority of our brothers have denounced it, yet it's there in some books like Tabari. But to be fair, yes, academically, uh, to be fair, they have denounced it because they believe it's against uh, the teachings of the Quran, whereby it is told that the Prophet somehow heard revelations thinking that it's from God, and the revelations somehow said, you must prostrate to the idols. In other words, the idols, so he prostrated before idols, and so on and so forth. In any case, Imam alayhi salam says, إن الله إذا اتخذ عبدا رسولا أنزل عليه السكينة والوقار. If Allah chooses an individual as a messenger or a prophet, gives them that tranquility, that acceptance, that yaqeen, that submission beforehand. That they know, yes, that they anticipate, that they realize, yes. It's like us when we receive, it's, I mean, these are figurative examples, I'm not comparing, but if sometimes we get a message from an individual without a name, we know them so well, or we've been told or warned. So we have a good idea where that person, where that message is from, even though there's no name, yes? Or we are answering a phone call and somebody's on the other line that we recognize, or we're expecting the call. Somebody saying, someone's gonna call you and say, yes, 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 I've been waiting for your call. Yes, there is that anticipation. So definitely Musa alayhi salam, as with all the other prophets, had that particular anticipation that there will be a revelation from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's number one. And number two, another proof is they see extraordinary signs like this. Like Musa alayhi salam, this is not a normal occurrence to see this particular tree in this state. Seemingly burning, but of course, in reality, it's just light. Musa, therefore, is getting closer to this particular tree, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, فَلَمَّا أَتَاهَا نُودِيَا يَا مُوسَى إِنِّي أَنَا رَبُّكْ فَخْلَعْ نَعْلَيْكِ this is a very interesting ayah in the Quran. And you know, it's a, one of those that gives these mystics or arafa and those who reflect on the Quran goosebumps and they become ecstatic when they read this ayah. It's one of those that you'll find them writing books about. Yes? Um, they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa, remove your shoes, remove your sandals. You are in a place known as Tuwa, in a sacred land, sacred valley known as Tuwa. And very interestingly, a wide variety of opinions have been presented as to why did Allah say to Musa at the outset of this communication, the first thing he says to him, Remove your shoes, your sandals or your shoes. Some of us Sirin have said that, and there are narrations that point to this, that Musa's shoes were made out of the skin of an animal that was not slaughtered in the right way. Yeah? And uh, it was a dead animal, for instance, right? And the leather used from that dead animal, perhaps Musa did not know, and Allah says to him, remove that particular covering of your feet. But many of the scholars have really said this is a very unlikely possibility. Because this declaration and request by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala denotes something quite important, quite big, you know, to remove your shoes. There must be something associated with this. Others have come forward and said, that shoes here is in reference to fear. Why? 
فخر الدين الرازي علامة فخر الدين الرازي in his tafsir al-kabir he says if you ever see in your dreams shoes because you know there's this world of dreams and what you see so for instance they say apparently if in your dream you see uh, you're drinking milk it means you're acquiring knowledge yeah or for instance if you see shoes it doesn't apply if you're drinking coca-cola by the way yes but if you see that you are somehow or anything to do with the shoes although in in a kind of arab culture shoes is very frowned upon um, it's considered uh, um, something quite negative but apparently in dreams according to this particular mufassir of the quran he says it is in relate relate related to family as zawjatu wal walad so um, some of the mufassirin have said Allah says to Musa, Musa, take off your shoes in reference to the fact that Musa was worried. He had fear about two things. Number one, he feared that his family, his wife and his child or whoever is with them is alone. And number two, perhaps more, was the fact that he's about to go to see Fir'aun. And you know, it's not any Joe Bloggs that he's about to go and see. This is Pharaoh who have said Ana Rabbukum al-A'la and also wants to capture Musa because he accuses him of killing that copt individual. So Allah is saying to Musa, don't worry about those two fears. Remove those fears from your heart as you are about to communicate with me. Take it away from your mind, your soul. Other Mufassirin have said no. This is a demonstration of the requirement of Musa السلام, to understand that he's in a sacred place. It's a sacred valley and part of the etiquettes and the adab of approaching a place which is sacred is to remove your shoes or your sandals. Yeah? And that's why of course today in the holy lands, in the city of Mecca, in the, in the Masjid al-Haram, in Masjid al-Nabawi, in the shrines of the Imma alayhum as -salam, it is what? It is out of respect that the zuwar, or the individuals, the worshippers, remove what? Their shoes. It's a part of the ada, part of the etiquettes, or the recommendations of the visitation of that holy sacred place, isn't it? Yes? And uh, it's interesting actually, that uh, I was reflecting on the difference in this aspect between Masjid al-Haram, Mecca al-Mukarramah, and, uh, and Medina al-Munawwara, Masjid al-Nabawi, and our holy shrines. And you find in the holy shrines, the shoes don't even enter at all. Because they're taken at the beginning, or most of them, but sometimes because it's busy, they, they, they say, take it with you or give you a bag. But generally they have people the Keshwaniya, or they're called outside, they take your sandals or shoes and give you a ticket. Yes? I know it's a bit of a weight, especially for our sisters, God help them. But generally speaking, it is something which is quite interesting because you enter without. Whereas in Masjid al Haram, in the Kaaba al Musharrafah, and in Medina, you go in with your shoes, albeit um, you know, you're not wearing them. The other understanding of this is that, look, Musa السلام, is in a holy land, is in a sacred valley known as Tuwa. You want this sacred valley to touch you everywhere. So why would you want to be wearing shoes that prohibits the sacred valley from coming into contact with your feet? You want the soil to be in contact with you. So remove your shoes because you are in a blessed Land. Let your feet be blessed. Let it uh, uh, somehow uh, obtain this barakah, this uh, uh, special element regarding that place. But you find some other scholars have looked deeper into this uh, verse and have said the shoes here represent materialism and this world. And perhaps this is arguably the strongest of the opinions. They say, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to have a communication with Musa. Yes? You and I also stand in communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, isn't it? 
And the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to somehow disconnect from this world and connect with Him. That's why you can't eat. That's why you can't talk. Yes, and there is one direction towards the Kaaba, and you stand and there are things that you say and you supplicate. Musa alayhi salam here has come and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give him a message, wants to give him a responsibility, wants to communicate with him. He's saying, oh Musa, leave and abandon this world and materialism. Come to me for me only, sincerely, purely, just for me. Yeah? Because of course, the Quran says, interestingly, that the heart cannot love two things at the same time. You cannot love this world and God together. The Quran says it's impossible. Yeah? Now, we may think we do, but the reality may shock us. But the key thing here is that there is a a story that Musa alayhi salam one day was walking and saw a man in sajda, saw a man in prostration. And when he saw him in sajda, he said to himself, what a good act that this person is doing, he's in prostration. After a while, he came back to the same site and saw the same man still in prostration. And thought to himself, you know what? I think by now, God has forgiven him because he's been in the state of prostration for such a long time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to him, according to riwayat narrations, that, O oh Musa, if this man remains in sajda until his neck cracks and his head separates from his body, Allah will never forgive him. Why? The narration states, Allah says to Musa, it's because he has come to ask me, but his heart is full of the love of this world. Yes, so there is a dichotomy, there is a, there is actually a hypocrisy. That's why we are told that حُبُّ dunya رَأْسُ كُلَّ خَطِيئَةً That the love of this world, when we say love of this world, we mean materialism, possessions. Yes, when we allow this world to possess us, not that we possess it, and there's a difference. Possessing it means we, when we lose it, it's fine. When it's taken away from us, it's fine. We do not become individuals who strive 24-7 for it. That's what it means. Not to be possessed by it, but to possess it. And these are directions from what? From the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum salam with regards to the, the notion of um, denouncing materialism and this world. Interestingly, this ayah has been a subject of various stories in history. And we'll just mention the story and inshallah we'll end. There was a sultan by the name of Sultan Murad who was an Ottoman uh, caliph. And one day he decided to visit the holy city of Najaf. So whilst he was traveling with his entourage towards the city of Najaf on horses or camels or whatever, one of his advisors was one of the Shia, one of the Mu'aleen, one of the lovers of the Ahl al-Bayt. So when they were approximately several kilometers away from Najaf, they saw the dome. At that time, there were no high buildings, so you could see the dome far, far away, several kilometers away. So this Shia advisor of Sultan Murad, what does he do? He dismounts from the horse and starts walking. So the Sultan looks at him and says, why are you walking? He says, it's because this individual is one of the four khulafa, one of the four khulafa, and therefore out of respect for this individual, I'm going to walk to his shrine. Sultan Murad said, that's good. I respect him also, that's why I've come to visit him. I will also dismount and walk. There was a few, or at least one nasibi. Nasibi means who? No one who hates the Ahl al-Bayt. And there are some narr narrations or pointers that a nasibi is also an individual who hates the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. Okay? So this man says to uh, Sultan Murad, he said, look, you are a Khalifa and he's a Khalifa. And a Khalifa who is alive has a higher status than a Khalifa who's dead. So therefore you should not be walking but on your feet. You should be continuously riding. So there was commotion, people arguing. Sultan said, fine, the way to solve this is to pick up the Holy Quran. Let's open up the Holy Quran 
and see what Allah directs us. This is known as istiftah, not istikhara. Istiftah means, you know, you, you're, you're, you're wanting some kind of direction. You, you know, what is going to happen? It's not that you have a choice and you have a difficulty making one or either or. So he picked up the Holy Quran. He opened it and which ayah came up? This one. فَخْلَعْنَ عَلَيْكَ إِنَّكَ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَى Subhanallah. Take off your shoes. You are in a blessed land. So apparently the Sultan Murad then punished that particular individual, decided to walk, but also decided to walk barefoot because the Quran says, remove your shoes. You are in a blessed land, sacred land. And this whole, this idea of removing the shoes was also something that Allama Hilli, Radwanullahi Ta'ala Alay, one of our great scholars, of course, utilized when it came to the presentation of the madhab of the Ahl al-Bayt to the people of Persia, Iran at that time. Most of you have heard of this story, of course, where by this um, particular Safawi king, uh, Shah Khuda Bandeh, yeah, this particular uh, king, he was angry and divorced his wife. But when he divorced his wife, he said, I divorce you three times. And in many uh, jurisprudential schools of thought of uh, our brothers, the Ahl al-Sunnah, you cannot take your wife back if you divorce her three times unless somebody else marries her, consummates the marriage, then divorces her. So you cannot do that. So he was uh, remorseful and wanted someone to help him. And they said, look, there is a scholar, but although he belongs to a school of thought which we reject, he's in Hilla in Iraq. His name is Allama Hilli. He may have a different opinion. And Allama Hilli said to him, yes, in our school of thought, you have to be in the right state of mind, not angry, there must be witnesses. So, you know, your wife, you can return in our school of thought. So he requested that, of course, the uh, scholar comes to, I think it was Isfahan. Allah Mahalli comes to Isfahan. On the journey, the entourage, those who surrounded the, uh, the Shah, Khuda Bandar, said to him, this man, his teachings are not from the Prophet. They are from the man by the name of Abdullah ibn Saba. It's a Jewish background. Therefore, don't trust him. Don't listen to him. This is not genuine. It's not from the Prophet. Yes? So, when Allah Mahalli entered the palace or the place where the Shah was sitting, he took his sandals off and placed it under his arms, armpits, and walked. So as soon as he did that, the people around the king said, look, he has bad manners because you're not supposed to come in with your sandals. You should leave it outside. You're in a place, you know, you're next to the king. How can you bring your sandals with you? Allah Mahalli looks at them and says, I did so because the followers of Imam Malik did so at the time of the Holy Prophet. And that's why I do it. So the Malikis were one of the four schools of thought in Islam, looked at him and said, that's nonsense. The followers of Imam Malik were not there at the time of the Prophet. He said, then I must have made a mistake. It must have been the followers of uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. The Hanbalites said, that's also rubbish because the, the Ahmad ibn Hanbal came some, uh, hun, over a hundred years after the Prophet. Yes, He said, oh, maybe it's a Shafi'i. Yeah, and the same was said about Shafi'i, yes? Then the Hanafites, those who follow Abu Hanifa, was also referred to. When the four all rejected this particular claim, Allah Mahalli looks at Shah Khuda Banda and said, O king, I come to you from a school of thought that their followers were there at the time of the Prophet and the leader was there at the time of the Prophet and our teachings are directly from Rasulullah. Yes, directly from the Holy Prophet to Amir al muminin to the Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt And therefore this uh, illustrates the ability of our scholars to think outside the box when it comes to presenting the teachings and to uh, make individuals understand and trigger their rational deduction and present proof where it is needed. 
وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم وسلم على سيد المرسلين محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين